Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, great webinar. Uh, fundraising was a very interesting topic at our meetings. Uh, our members uh, usually say that fundraising is the issue that uh, we all face. Uh, today with us uh, is um, Aviva Rosenberg and John Halper. So uh, Aviva is a board member and uh, she will introduce our speaker. I'm Biljana Ivanovic and I'm uh, vice chair of International Goshe Alliance. So welcome everyone. Go Great, on. thank you. So um, thank you, my, and I'm Aviva. It's so nice to see all everybody here. Um, so I met Jonah Halper about, I guess about probably 12 years ago, and he was doing this talk um, for a different organization that I was volunteering for. And um, it really changed the way about um, kind of how I thought about fundraising and raising money for organizations that we are passionate about. And these these are techniques that um, I really can use no matter you know what what the cause is. And so I thought it was would be nice to bring it to Gaucher and to our community. And hopefully we could you know raise awareness and ultimately raise money for you know the issues that are most important to us so jonah is a thought leader on nonprofit fundraising and marketing he specializes in new donor getting new donors and engaging new leaders in 21st century philanthropy he's president of altruicity a fundraising consulting and project management firm and has helped many organizations across north america raise millions of dollars in their annual capital and endowment campaigns jonah is the author of date your donors it's a book that demonstrates how the process and execution of fundraising is like courtship and making it accessible to anyone and a vital model for success in the 21st century. Jonah lives in Israel. He's married to Rebecca, who's a pediatric nurse and has four children, a Siamese cat that's named after his favorite beverage, whiskey. So Jonah, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you very much, Aviva. And thank you, everybody, uh, for inviting me to participate and to uh, talk a little bit about fundraising today. Um, Aviva, Aviva did a good job explaining that this isn't going to be like a manual, right? This is not going to be from page 86 to 105, how you can raise a million dollars. I think for us to, to approach fundraising in a way that's more of a lens, uh, something that you can look through so that when you are face to face with a donor, whether you're doing an event, whether you're galvanizing volunteers around a program, whatever it is that's going to be you interfacing with the community is going to help you think in, in a way that is going to foster success in leadership development and in fundraising. And um, I hope that these slides and what I'm gonna talk about today will help you. Um, just so you know, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, these slides will be made available to you. Um, I'll send them to Aviva and the leadership of, uh, of the International Gaucher Alliance. So you have uh, these slides after the, the talk and it's also being recorded. So I really appreciate you having me. Um, Aviva did a, a fine job on the intro. Um, and I wrote a book a couple of years ago on date your donors, how to attract and engage new donors and through the lens of relationships, right? And I'm talking a lot about how there's similarities between developing a personal relationship and fundraising. Um, and when I did this talk and when, when Aviva heard me speak about it, um, I gave it kind of a, a, an opening that usually works more effectively when you're in person, but we're, we're living in the day and age of Zoom and, and less, less often face-to-face -face talking, um, but I, I wanted to share with you uh, what I used to share live with people, and it has a little bit more of an impactful feeling when you're face-to-face, -face. but I would start off my talks and say to everybody that I'm a nice guy, I'm very generous, I'm someone you can bring home to your mother. I make a good living. And then I would point to someone in the audience and say, will you marry me? Right? And everyone laughs, right? The person I'm asking usually shifts around a little uncomfortable, right? And uh, then I say, okay, let me sweeten the deal. I give them a list, I'll give you a list of references, character references, professional references for all the things that I claim I am, right? Everything that I claim, I'll give you people you can call that will attest to the fact that I'm other focused and kind and generous and, you know, all the things that might be important to you in a mate, someone that you'd say, I want to marry, I'll give you all that information. Is that enough? Will you marry me? And the person will say no, right? Most of the time they say no. And when I ask them why they say no, they say they don't know me. 
So I said, that's fascinating because fundraising is the same thing, right? You can have the greatest mission. You can have the greatest product. You can be serving X number of people and providing Y number of services. But if you don't have a personal relationship with that person, so why should they be invested with you? You might get a, a $10 or 10 euro gift, but if you want $1,000 or $10,000, something that would make someone pause and say, am I willing to be a partner in this? Then there needs to be a relationship. So I'm making an assumption, we're going to kind of make a, uh, an assumption that for successful fundraising, there needs to be a relationship. So I'm presupposing that as like a baseline that if you want to be able to raise money for your efforts locally or globally for that matter, you need to make sure that relationships are a part of that mix. It's the only way to maintain your existing donors and to get them to give more over time and to identify and connect and engage new donors. Relationships are a must. So we're gonna to talk today, again, a lens, uh, through some of the things that are important to think about when you're talking to your existing partners, your existing donors, people who are already invested in what you're doing, as well as thinking in terms of how do I attract a wider base of people to support what I'm doing, right? We only have so many hours in the day. We have a, a contact list that only goes so deep. So if we want to be able to grow what we're doing, it needs to be more than just us. It's the reason why you could have an international alliance with leadership and committees and, and, and work that you're doing all over the place because it's more than just one person. The need is more than one person. And if you're trying to provide services for the Gaucher community around the world, it can't just be a Tanya. It can't just be an Aviva. It can't just be a Christine, right? You need to have are people rallying around you. And the only way to do that is if you're consciously and proactively investing in relationships. So there is a problem, all right? This is not a, a, a gaucher problem. This is not a, you know, uh, um, uh, United Way problem. This is not a Jewish uh, organization problem. This is a nonprofit problem that we've seen in the last 10 years that we are hemorrhaging donors. Right, so that when you bring in, let's say, 100 new donors, we're losing about half of them every year. So the only way that people are keeping their ship afloat is getting that many more new donors to kind of offset what was lost the prior year and to hopefully raise a little bit more than they did the prior year. But we are not doing a good job of retaining the people who give to us. The person who gave us $10 last year or $1,000 last year, it's not a guarantee that they're going to give again this year and give as much as they did or give more. This is a problem in the nonprofit sector as a whole. So I'm going to give you an explanation of why this is. Um, and the way to best understand it is to look at the retail world. So this is Times Square in New York City um, in the 1950s. As you can see, the number of advertisements on the wall are few and far between. You can see Pepsi Cola, you can see Camel cigarettes, you can see a handful of different ads that are found in Times Square. This is Times Square nowadays. Well, I mean, I don't know if as many people nowadays because of Corona and COVID restrictions, I haven't been in New York in a while, so I don't know if you see this many people, but we live in a, in a, in a place that has, that's inundated with advertisement. There was a marketing company that did a study that they would wait for people to walk through Times Square. And when they got to the other side, they would pull them over, they'd have their clipboard in hand, and they would ask the people who had just walked through Times Square, how many ads that they remember, that remember from walking through Times Square. And they just did it. They just walked through Times Square. And they're getting asked 30 seconds after they get through it, how many ads that they can remember. And the average person can remember approximately two to three ads, and that's it. There are 2,000 ads in Times Square, but they can only remember two. To me, that is incredible. Think about how much money and how much investment in time and energy went into designing, producing, and then paying for the ads that show up in Times Square. And then to find out that the average person is only going to remember a couple of them, that's incredible. So what's the problem? Why is this the case? Why is it that people don't remember a lot? 
The answer is, if you walk into any convenience store, you'll see that you have so many options. If you want to buy a deodorant, right? Look at, look at the deodorant section and tell me how many deodorants you see, right? Antiperspirants that you can choose between. And they all work. They all smell good. They all will keep you from perspiring, right? That all the things that you want in a deodorant, they're all fine. So question is, if you're a retail company and, you're ha and you have to win over more of the market share, get more customers, how do you compete in a market where there's 40,000 options? Back in the day, back in the 1950s, if you go back to the Times Square of the 1950s, right? When we talk about the companies and the products, there was only ever one or two products in a category. If you were not number one, you were number two. And that was it. It's how you became a brand like Kleenex and yet be synonymous with tissues, right? Can you pass me a Kleenex? Is it for sure a Kleenex? Not necessarily. It could be another brand of tissue, but we, we at least in the United States, and maybe this isn't true in all countries, but maybe there are other examples that are more relevant to where you're, where you're dialing in from. But everyone has those products that are synonymous with what it is because it was the, the only game in town. It was the only option. And if you were not the only option, for example, uh, rental car companies in the United States, there were two car companies. There were Hertz and Avis. The, the tagline for Avis, they were the number two company, was we try harder, right? You don't have to be the best, but we try harder than the best one, right? And, and if you think about it, when you would listen to an advertisement on the radio, they would say, used to say, we're better than the competition. We're better than the other guy. But we don't hear that much anymore because when there's 40 options to be better than the other guy, right, is not really honest. It's not really accurate. Why would you want to compete there? And the, and, the, and the companies that do try to compete on product, what happens? They try to become the cheapest, the fastest. They run, it's like a race, the lowest, lowest common denominator, right? We're going to appeal to you because we're the fastest and the cheapest. Does that now, can anyone tell me that they enjoy their airline experience when they get on a plane and it's the cheapest and the fastest and the, no. They've taken away the luxury of the airline experience and we're left with seats that can barely fit my kids. And here I am sitting in fetal position for a 12 hour flight. So the idea of standing out as a product was something that the retail market had to figure out. Now that we've got so many options, how do you stand out? And the answer is actually quite simple. They focus more on the relationships. They put a face on the brand. They appeal to you emotionally. So when you're standing in front of an aisle of 15 different deodorants, you'll say, oh, I remember that Old Spice guy, the one who was in a bath towel and you know being all romantic to everybody. And it was a big social media phenomenon in the early, early you know, mid 2000s. And here was something that would represent a person. And I know who they were. They were, if you're an insurance company, it was um, the Geico Gecko. It was a cute mascot. And we just started seeing a lot more focus on making an emotional appeal to make me feel like I'm friends with this company, as opposed to extolling the virtues of how they are better, faster, cheaper, and whatnot. They started focusing more on putting a human face on it. So the idea of making your organizations, whatever country you're in, stand out is going to rely on the relationships because anybody who wants to start a nonprofit can take $200, open up a website, use the same tools that you use to talk to your people, whether it's emails or newsletters or you know, events, whatever it is, everyone else can do it too. So the noise, the clutter is just astronomical. So the question is, how do you stand out? And the answer is very simple. In the age of email, nothing will be a handwritten note. And I mean that literally, but I also mean it, mean it metaphorically speaking, that if you're going to start looking at what you're doing through the lens of, is this helping me develop real authentic relationships, partnerships? So we'll talk about that in a moment, what a partnership means uh, when you talk about fundraising. It needs to be something that's going to emphasize the relationship. It's the only way to stand out is to invest in the relationship. So 
there's really two main buckets. If you think about fundraising, there's really two audiences. They're the ones who are already donors and the ones who are not yet donors. And one of my favorite uh, quotes uh, from, uh, it was an early TED talk. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he used to always say that everybody loves classical music. They just don't know it yet. Um, he was a famous uh, uh, pianist and famous teacher um, and I'm blanking on his name. However, uh, I'll make sure everyone gets it afterwards and I'll even see if I can find the video. But, but effectively he would say that everybody, well, you in your case, everyone loves your organization. They just don't know it yet. And when you talk about your donors or existing donors, it's our, how do we ensure that they are current, these current donors are giving at their current levels and how do we inspire them to give more of their time and money? And then the other piece of it, there are people who are not yet donors. How do we identify potential partners who value what we value and will support our work? But interestingly, it starts with the people you already know. Even the people who are giving you small gifts of $5, $10, whatever currency you're, you're raising money in, uh, it starts with your existing donors. Because if your hope, and we'll get to a little bit more in detail about it, transitioning from existing to perspective, if your hope is to get new donors, it's not opening up Forbes magazine and pointing to the millionaires and billionaires on the list and say, how do I raise money from them for Gaucher? Because it's gonna be a waste of your time. Is it possible that you can make a, a connection that way? It's possible, but more often than not, it's going to come from your existing network. And if you're not investing in your existing network and treating them like partners and as donors, then how will they introduce you to their friends and family? How will they help you expand your reach if you're not investing on the, in the actual people that you already have within your, your sphere of influence? So we're going to first talk, as you can see from the slide, we're going to first talk about existing donors, a couple of helpful techniques that I think will, be, will serve you guys well, and then we'll focus on people who are not yet donors, but should be. So again, this is back to a slide I said before about the hemorrhaging is that 43% of donors did not get, repeat their gift from the prior. So I said 50%, it's actually 43%. This data came out last, uh, in 2019. And, and that, that's 43% of the number of donors and it, it reflected 47% of the dollars an organization raised um, were, were, not, were not raised again. It was that we're raised again, that was it, nothing more. Only 47% of dollars, 43% of people um, gave again. So that means a little bit more than half of the people did not continue to giving. So this is clearly something that we should focus on when it comes to retaining your existing donors. We don't want them to hemorrhage. We don't want them to disappear. So how do we do this in a way like the retail world figured out to develop a real authentic relationship? So for existing donors, we have to ask ourselves two very simple questions. And this is something we should always ask in any communication, in any conversation, is do your, under, do your donors understand why their giving is critical? Why are they essential partners in your cause? Why can't it be done without them? So the answer might be as simple as you donor and 99 other donors that we have help us get from point A to point B. And if, you, or if you're not the one to give, right? It means I got to go find somebody else to do it because we're not going to be able to do what we want to do. The great work that we do, we need your support. It could be as simple as that. And fundraising in, in essence is that message. We're not fundraising to make payroll. That's not why we raise money. We raise money to say, this is where we are. This is what we're doing today. And this is where we need to be. And with your help and with 99 other people's helps or however many people or however much money needs to be raised, we can get from point A to point B. And the moment you make that clear to a donor, or, or whether it's existing or a potential donor, they go, oh, okay, I understand. If I give and all these other people give as well, we'll be able to go from here to there. I get it. And what it's also important, important about that message is it's not treating a donor like an ATM machine, right? It's not about how much money the donor has. It's about the mission. It's about being a partner. It's saying, you have the money, I have the organization, together as partners, we can go from point A to point B. That's a very different conversation. And often it, when you think about it this way, it takes the pressure off 
or the the uh, the dirty feeling like you're you know you're just asking for money, right? When you start focusing on what that money is accomplishing, you're focusing on the fact that it's not about the money; it's about what the money can help the organization do. So if you frame a question to a donor or um, to, to support or to say to an existing donor, this is why your giving is critical, you will retain that donor. It's as simple as that. Are we doing a good job communicating why their giving is critical? And then the second half of that is just an extension. Is do your donors understand why their increased giving is critical? Okay, so for where we are today, your $1,000 is amazing. Your partnership for what we are doing today is vital to our success. Thank you. But let me tell you about where we're headed and why we need your help even more. And if you can paint that picture and say, this is where we are and this is where we're headed, the donor will say, now I understand why you need another $100 or another $1,000 or whatever the dollar amount is, I understand it. And it, again, it takes off that dirty piece of it because it's you're, you're doing it because not you're not going to them just because they have money. It's not a superficial connection relationship. It's about the mission. It's about doing what you need to do. And you will find that when you talk in this way to people who could be a donor, you will find like, oh, that wasn't such a bad experience. That wasn't, that wasn't awkward. It didn't feel like I was like, you know, dialing for dollars. It felt like I was focused on the, the product, focused on our mission, what we're doing, and giving them the opportunity to participate in that. And that's the way growth happens is these are our donors and where they are now, and how do we get them to continue growing with our organization, the work that our organization is doing. And so that, so that's, um, so, okay, so there's really two techniques I wanna share. One of them is treat them like partners. If you say, we have a calendar year, all right, 12 months, and we do a variety of things for gauche awareness or other types of things that we could plug people into, invite them to things, make a clearinghouse of what those things are. Because if you're going to treat an existing donor as a real partner, the relationship doesn't start or it doesn't stop, excuse me, it doesn't stop when you take the money. There are organizations out there that will go and say, hi, can you give, give some money to X, Y, and Z organization? You give that money. And when's the next time you hear from them? One year later, right? How good do you really feel? You feel like, all right, kind of took, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's a good cause, but like, I don't feel like I have any investment, or any partnership in it. But if we would instead say, what are the things that we do throughout the year that we could introduce or expose or educate our donors to feel more connected to what we're doing? There's some organizations that are doing some phenomenal like quarterly conference calls where they'll say, okay, every quarter, anyone who's a donor or there's certain parameters, maybe if it's a donor who gives above a certain amount or maybe monthly donors, whatever the, the right audience might be, might, maybe you open it up to any, anyone who's donated in the last year to say that we're gonna do a conference call to talk about what we're doing with, you know, with our local Gaucher chapter and the work that we're doing, maybe have someone come on and talk about how the organization has helped them and helped them thrive, got them the medication that they needed, got them access to doctors, got them a support system with their peers, people from across the world who are going through what, what, what they're going through, to, to be able to introduce something into the calendar or different points during the calendar where a donor can feel like I am being treated like a real partner. They took my money and that's where the relationship started. And now I hear from them on occasion and to share the impact of, of, of their work with me, who is an investor, an investor with what they're doing. And I mean investor quite literally. When you are investing with a stockbroker, if you give that stockbroker $50,000, you better hear from that stockbroker. You want to know, how's my money doing, right? With the markets going on, do we need to move things around? Do we need to be more conservative? Do we need to be more aggressive? We need, this is, this is the relationship that you have once money is given to an investor. So same thing, you take money from a donor, they are investing in you. And to be able to say what your money's doing um, throughout the calendar year is really important. So the suggestion is don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to, invent new programs and touch points. Take a calendar and say, what do we do throughout the year that might be a good fit for our people to participate in some way, whether it's uh, by phone, by video, by email, what are things that we can do to touch people and use those touch points intentionally and say, this is coming up and there's an opportunity there. 
And if, if they're a donor and there's something physical, if there's an event or something going on in your community that you think they'll be that they will value and appreciate and it will enhance the relationship, invite them to join you, to go in person. This is just to get you thinking in terms of how do we engage our existing donors throughout the year? So that's one, one suggestion. Come on, why is it not moving? Ah, thanking your donors. This might sound obvious, right? When your donor gives money, you say, thank you. Thank you for your gift. But it's, it could be so much more than just a verbal cue that you know to say that all our, our parents hopefully taught us when we were children is to say thank you when we are given something. When you as an organization are getting support from donors, you have an opportunity to say thank you, not just when you take the gift, but in the weeks, months, and years of those gifts, you're able to show and demonstrate your appreciation. I'm gonna share with you a brief video of an organization that for me is kind of like my muse. A lot of the creativity and ideas and inspiration I get from this organization that's based in New York, it's called Charity Water. They, they provide clean drinking water for developing countries, prim primarily in Africa and India. And they did a thank you campaign where they sent, they did over 150 video thank yous for people who either donated their birthday, um, donated a, you know, some other major milestone event or did something marathon or bike ride where they solicited their family and friends for charity water. So they did over 150 videos that are all available online. And they decided we're not just gonna say thank you. They're going to make it personal and they're going to make it creative and they're going to show that they're actually viewing the donor as a real partner. So we had this video is to a donor who decided that she was going to wear her little black dress for a full month in support of Charity Water and that she would raise money around this kind of awkward and uh, definitely creative uh, fundraising initiative. By the way, can you hear? I'm not sure. Is the video able to be heard? Yes, we can hear it. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks, Olivia. <laughs> hey, Summer. I'm Lindsay. And I'm Jasmine. And today is Charity Water's fifth birthday, and we wanted to take the opportunity to thank campaigners like you who took time out of your busy schedule to fundraise for water programs. Um, you raised 12, over $12,000 by wearing your little black dress for the month of March. And uh, you've been such a wonderful supporter of Charity Water for years. And we're really, really thankful for your support. And we think that that was a phenomenal idea. I'm going to start wearing only this shirt to work every day. And Jazzy, I think, might start wearing his Charity Water shirt to work every day and just spicing it up a little bit, some, some accessories. Thank you. How amazing was that, right? They just, they decided to take a day. They had a video camera set up and they did 150 videos with different staff members from Charity Water to thank their donors. Such a beautiful, beautiful idea. And it just shows the donor that the organization truly, truly cares about them. So uh, the second recommendation is to think creatively. It, you don't have to necessarily put all those accessories on and the hats and the glasses, but to think creatively, how can we truly demonstrate, demonstrate um, thank yous to our donors for the work, for the money that they're providing and the time that they're putting in to help your Gaucher chapter succeed? All right, so now we're going to talk about prospective donors, because the ability to go, as I mentioned at the top of the program, the ability to go to people who are not yet donors is only possible if you're already treating your existing donors like partners, because those people will be more than welcome to introduce you to their friends and family when they see that they have such a positive experience. And, and mind you, you will stand out as an organization when you do this, because if other people are hiding behind their computers um, and they're not necessarily trying to engage in a, in a more a relationship driven way, guess who's going to stand out? You are. So when it comes to developing relationships that go on, go beyond your existing donors, 
this is going to be a very effective uh, tool and technique. So the question is, how do we identify potential donors or potential partners who value what we value and support our work? So this is a wonderful um, example of this. Uh, um, ba it's based off of something that was popularized by an uh, author and marketer named Seth Godin called Permission Marketing. And he shares this wonderful example of how do you know or how can you find people who care about what you care about? So the, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, are very big in st into statistics. They have data, data, data. Um, they can do. They know as far as um, the ability for them, them to door door to do door knocking, introducing people to the Church of Latter Day Saints, and to they know what works, what doesn't work. They're very big into statistics. And I gave this talk, and I use this as an example at the Association of Fundraising Professionals in front of four thousand people. And I use I shared this uh, case study, and there were Mormons in the audience, and they came over to me after the program, and I was nervous. I was like. This better be right because I heard this, you know, not firsthand, but secondhand, this better be accurate. And they can earn me and said, this is indeed true. They have their, their back end of their website where they get a lot of their collateral materials and the materials that they use to share their, their mission and their church with people who are not yet part of their mission and church. They say that they are very big into statistics and they know what works and what doesn't work. So they know statistically that if they knock on your door, right? And they knock on a thousand doors that only one in 1,000 people will say that they're interested in learning when they say, would you like to learn about the Church of Latter-day Saints? Only one in 1,000 households will, will say yes. When you, have a, you knock on a thousand doors, you're going to get one yes. Now, how disheartening is this statistic? Can you imagine being that door knocker that person is going to say, I want to, I believe in the mission of my church. I want to share this with more people. And I want to ask them, would you like to learn about the Church of Latter-day Saints? If I knew that the odds of having success were one in 1,000, I would quit before I even started. So they know this to be the case. However, if they knock on the door and instead of saying, would you like to know, would you like to learn about the Church of Latter-day Saints? If they say, would you like to say a prayer with me? That number goes down from one in 1,000 to one in seven. Now that's all another story, right? To know that I can knock on seven doors and one out, of, one out of every seven will be interested in saying a prayer with me. That's really, really interesting. And why do they do this? Because they know if you're the type of person that be willing to say a prayer with them, then you might be able to build on that permission to say, well, you, we, we said a prayer together. We, we have that connection. We made a connection. I'd love to tell you a little bit more about this prayer and where it came from and talk a little bit about the church. Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Right. We've made that, we've made that love connection to use a, a real love connection example. If I walk over to a random woman on the subway or a random man on the subway and said to them, will you marry me? What are the odds of them saying yes? Like the beginning top of the program, the odds are slim to none. But if I see a woman on the subway and I see her listening on her iPod, iPod uh, on her iPhone, uh, Cheryl Crow or some musician that I know, I can say, say to her, hey, I saw Cheryl Crow in concert. It was so amazing, bup, 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 bup. And I can have a conversation, a connection, not about asking her to marry me, but about the thing that I see that she's connected in and say, I, I too have a shared connection with Cheryl Crow, that singer. And then maybe if I see her two or three more times, maybe the next time I see her, this is, you know, I'm 40. So we still had mixtapes when I was a kid. Maybe I'll make a mixtape for her of some maybe B-sides or like, you know, live recordings of Cheryl Crow that she might not have ever heard of. And then maybe the third time I see her, I might say, hey, Cheryl Crow's coming to town. Would you like to go to a concert with me? Now, the odds of her saying yes go way up. Because what I've done is I've built permission. I'm not looking to go from, hi, my name is Tanya or Aviva or Christine, right? I'm not just saying, hi, I, this, I, we've never met. Would you be a donor? I'm saying that whatever it is for you and your audience, what's that low barrier connection that you can make with somebody to introduce what you do? 
You might not be able to say, hi, would you like to learn about the, the equivalent of the Church of Latter-day Saints? Would you like to learn about the, our, our Gaché Alliance, our, 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 what we're doing in Gaché? They might say, ah, oh, no, 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 thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you. But if you can find something that's a low barrier connection on what, you know, maybe the topic of genetic diseases, screenings, health, other aspects that you think might be a fit, which would give you a good indicator that this is something that they have shared values in. The values that are, that are important to your organization on a international level and a local level, if you can kind of hone in on what those are. And then when you're talking to people, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's in email communication or asking people to do a survey or fill information, to be able to do it in a way that's low barrier so you can identify these, these kind of connections and say, they might be someone who's interested in what we have to offer. So instead of being a one in 1,000 chance, it goes down to one in seven. And those are much, much better odds. Let me give you a quick example of an organization that did this really well. There's a volunteer organization that was based in New York City, where the way they did it was they would do soup kitchens, uh, children's hospitals, they had all of these volunteer opportunities. So how do they promote this volunteer organization? Every year they would do a very fancy schmancy bar night or club experience for a young, you know, 20, early 20 somethings. And they would get, have a good time at the event. They would show a brief video about the organization. And then after the event was over and they'd send people pictures of, of the event, they'd say, if you want to volunteer with us, you can come to us to the, the children's hospital or you can come to us with, with us to the soup kitchen. What they found they had very low conversion rate, very low people who would, they may have a thousand people at this big event and they saw the video, right? They know what the organization is, but it doesn't, didn't translate into volunteers. So not very effective. What they decided to do is something very smart and it speaks to this idea of a low barrier to entry, a permission-based marketing. What do they do is they said, instead of just paying the usual ticket price, the Covera to, co the Covera to come into the event, they said, you have, you know, for, you can come, it costs the price of a toy that's going to go to a children's hospital or a canned food item to the soup kitchen. And they got some corporate sponsors to help underwrite it because obviously the, the ticket sales were not going to be there in dollars and cents. Um, it was going to be in basically food items and toys. What did they do? When the event was over, they sent that email out to everybody saying, look at the beautiful event. You all look beautiful. Here's you all, all you guys all dolled up and looking amazing and all this. But what do they do? They sent two versions of the email. To the people who donated a toy, they sent them an email saying, thank you for donating a toy to this event, to this, you know, to this hospital. We're going to that hospital with your toys to give them to the children. Would you like to join us? And for the people who gave the canned food item, they said, thank you for the canned food item. We're going to be going to the soup kitchen with your food, canned food item, and we're going to go serve food in the kitchen. Do you want to join us? And they had so many people who volunteered. They had to make multiple sessions. They didn't have room for everybody because people built, they built on the permission and people wanted to follow their, their gift to the next step, to their destination. And they felt there was a connection there. So for your organization too, like I said, it's a lens. I can't tell you, it's not a manual, but you have to think in terms of how can we <clears throat> introduce people to our work in a way that's low barrier to entry and we'll build on that permission. What does step one look like? What does step two look like? What does step three look like? And think in those terms of how you can funnel people who have no connection might have and, and figure out that they have common values in what you have to offer to get to the point of introducing your work and, and, get, and getting to the point where they will accept your marriage proposal. But in your case, it's a asking them to give to your organization. <clears throat> so when we talk about transitioning from existing donors to non-donors, this has always been my kind of my modus operandi on how to grow a young organization. It always starts with the one-on-one -on -one meetings, introducing what you're doing and the impact to people who are willing to listen. So when they, the, whoever your people are that were willing to say a prayer with you or whatever your variation of it is, is say, hey, can I have half an hour of your time? I'll come to your office or home and tell you a little bit more about what our work is. And you can even be as bold and say, this is not a solicitation. I, will want, I need more people to know about our work. You're influential in the community. You have relationships. You can open doors. Would it be okay if I share with you more about what our mission is and what we're doing? Have those one-on-one -on -one meetings. 
And then what you want to do is transition that so that the people who you met with, those one-on-one -on -one people, would possibly open their home to introduce your organization to their friends and family. So instead of being just one-on-one -on -one in the office, they say, yes, me and my wife or you know, whoever it is that's, that's the, uh, the family who's doing it, who you met with, met with we'll, we'll invite our people. So now in the age of COVID, and this is an often question I get, is how do you do this when you can't necessarily be in people's homes? I've done virtual parlor meetings. We did an event in New Jersey in a very affluent neighborhood in New Jersey where the woman who was hosting the parlor meeting, instead of hosting the food in her house and drinks in the house, she sent little balls of wine and chocolate to all her guests and they did it on Zoom. And they had people who were impacted by the mission. In fact, it was in some ways, the virtual version was even better because Sometimes when you do an event in New Jersey or wherever you live, you don't have access to people locally. You can't get someone on the plane. It's cost prohibitive to get them on the plane. But to have someone who's impacted by the organization or have the CEO, the head of the organization or people who are influential, doctors, scientists, whoever it is that could help sh um, shed light on the work that you're doing, to be able to do it on a virtual format can be very powerful and let the people bring it right into their own homes. They don't even have to get dressed no babysitter, right? You can do that right in their home, home, home and be creative with it. And then the parlor meetings will ultimately end up with events and, and other kinds of fundraising campaigns. Because if you have one-on-one -on -one meetings and then it translates into parlor meetings in people's homes. So now you've got, instead of just one-on-one, -on -one, you've got 12, 13, 15 couples who are, who are getting introduced to your organization. And then you say, well, I've got 15 people and, hope, and I'll do follow-up and we'll talk about that in a moment and to make sure that after that parlor meeting is, is over, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with the people who came to the event. So John and Jane Doe host a parlor meeting and let's say Beth and Frank Smith are there. I want to go get one-on-one -on -one meetings with Beth and Frank if I can help it, right? So that I'm able to continuously expand my reach and introduce more people. And I'm not focused on with my handout saying, can I have money? I'm getting more people to know about what we're doing. And ultimately, when I have a lot of people who say, how can we help, right? You, you've shared with us and we all are in concentric circles of relationships here, right? We all hosted parlor meetings. We invited our friends. How can we help and say, well, why don't we do a fundraising campaign? Can we raise $50,000, right? And they might, and, and give them the ability to say how they think they can work. Are they all a bunch of uh, bike bicycle enthusiasts? Can they do a bike marathon? Do they run? Can they do a marathon marathon? Uh, do they play poker? Do they play uh, Texas Hold'em poker on Thursday nights with their friends? Maybe do a charity poker tournament. But in the end of the day, when you start looking at your community and saying, how does this translate into dollars? Let your community help you figure that out. They, they have 50, 60, 70, 80, or 100 people who without even going to brand new people, if you do an event, now you can talk about even wider audiences, but if you have a host committee made up of the people you met, the one-on-ones, the parlor meetings, you're going to say, I've got 50, 60, 70 people, even before I even promote this in the community. So it's all about expanding your reach from one-on-one -on -one to parlor meetings to events and other types of campaigns. And a parlor meeting is pretty basic and simple. And I'm giving these tools. And like, while I said there's no manual, I'm going to give you a little few bullet points to help you get started on what that would look like after the one-on-one -on -one meetings. You want to identify the audience. And that's primarily the hosts, friends, and, and family, and colleagues, people they work with. But you, if you know the area and community, you can offer names too and say, you know, do you know this person? They live around the block from you, or they're an influential community leader. Can, can we invite them? Even if they don't necessarily know, know them, many hosts say, sure, invite them. I'm happy to have someone come into my home and learn more about the organization. Sometimes they'll say, no, no, I'd rather keep it to just friends and family, and that's fine as well. But you want to identify who those people are that you want to invite. Then you have to create the hook. Why do they want to come? Guests need reasons to show up. They, one reason is the host is telling them I'm doing something. So that's obviously a strong motivation. And there should be something that's entertaining that your organization, they don't know about yet, right? That your organization should say, oh, come learn about the Gaucher Alliance or whatever the name of your local chapter is. That's not necessarily going to be the hook. 
yet. So you need to have the host, which is obviously the major hook. They're opening up their home. And then to say, well, we we have a concert pianist who's going to come play. The host has a beautiful baby grand piano. We're going to have a, a, a brief performance from a uh, from this. Or I've done wine tastings. I've done parlor meetings where we've had um, owners of wineries uh, bring a, a lateral tasting of some of their wines for the, for the audience, the people in the home to come We'll do a wine tasting. Whatever it is, it should be some kind of hook that they would say, wow, this sounds like a fun night out. This is something I'd get a babysitting for, right? Or obviously not everyone needs babysitters, but something I would be willing to get dressed up for and go out and, and, and do that. Then obviously at the program, you want to be able to share the mission. The mission is not something you should be embarrassed of. It's not something that you're here for the wine tasting and the host, but let me, let me squeeze in there for a minute or two and talk a little bit about the organization. No. This, is, this event is in support of your chapter, your organization, your mission. This is who we are and what we do. You're gonna talk with confidence about what, you, what you're in the business of doing and where you're headed. And you're going to give the audience an opportunity to get involved. It doesn't have to be a hard sell. It doesn't have to be, hi, we need your money. It could be, we want more people in our community to know. We want more people to have access to medicine, da, 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 da. We are open to you getting involved. We would love to have your help. We have a variety of committee opportunities. We, 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 of course, we accept donations, things along those lines, but you wanna give them some kind of call to action, something that they can walk away instead of them being all fired up and saying, wow, I was really impressed with what they do, but they didn't tell me like, how can I help, right? You should have some kind of call to action at that program to let people have an opportunity to act upon how they feel in the moment because people give predominantly emotionally. The stories you tell are going to be powerful and, and of course, any data can back up the stories, but they're going to want to be able to make a difference right then and there. So give them that call to action is something you should absolutely consider doing. And then as I alluded to before, when you do parlor meetings, the one-on-one -on -one follow up is key. If they've invited 12 couples to a parlor meeting, you wanna give them the same treatment, the one-on-one -on -one meetings that the host of the parlor meeting experience so that you can continuously expand your reach. As you can see and hear from what I'm describing, this is very laborious because it's relationships. It's not something you can just phone in. It's something I actually have to spend time and energy on. But I can tell you that when you take this approach, it is so liberating and so motivating. And so it gives you such great energy because you see people's eyes light up. You see the education happen. And even if the dollars are not there yet, you know the dollars will be there eventually because you're getting people who are bought into the vision of what you're doing. So when you're talking about actually raising money, there's really a few different things here. I'm, I'm gonna wrap up in just a moment. There's capacity, passion, and relationship. The three types of criteria, when you have, let's say 50, 60, 70 people you wanna connect, capacity, do they have money? Passion, do their values align with your values and relationship? Are they connected to you directly or maybe one degree of separation away? And you should put these people into a, onto a list, grade them. I, this is a real chart of a client of mine for a capital campaign. You can see the names are hidden for privacy reasons, but they're rated grade A's further down the list is grade B's, C's for whether they have strong capacity, passion, and relationship. And then we set projections of what we think we can get from them. Now, again, don't be scared off by these numbers. This is for a capital campaign. These are people who've been drinking the Kool-Aid and in love with the organization for years. These are not like pie in the sky numbers. And, you know, but this is, these are the projections for this campaign. But if you put those names on a list, then you will pay attention to them and you grade them by the likelihood of them giving. You will then obviously go up after the lowest hanging fruit. And therefore you'll see and feel more motivation, momentum, because they're the ones who are responding best. You don't want to spend the time on the ones that you think are the biggest you know, hurdles to cross because it'll suck all the wind out of your sails. One, do the lowest hanging fruit, the ones, even if they're not necessarily the biggest donors, but the, if they fit C, capacity, P, passion, and R relationship really strongly, top of your list. Go to them and ask them to support what you're doing. And then you will find that you will be able to go further down the list and still maintain that kind of momentum. And then the other thing I suggest, and there's a gazillion tools that you can use, is track your relationships. That means if it means going for coffee, put it on the calendar, make it a real task. And uh, if you've ever read Stephen Covey's book on um, uh, uh, what's it called, the uh, seven habits or whatever it's called, he talks about the quadrants of priority. And one of them is 
important, but not urgent. Those are the ones that you have to watch out for because they're important. But if they're not urgent, if you're, if you're not pulling out a fire, then they don't get paid attention to. So for example, everything in cultivation and donor relationships is important, but not urgent until you get to the next campaign and go, ah, it's urgent. Now we need to raise the money. It's urgent. But you didn't invest in the coffee meetings. You didn't invest in the relationships, the one-on-one -on -one meetings, the parlor meetings. All that needs to happen when it's not urgent, but it's still important. So that is stuff that we that I would highly recommend you consider and track and make sure that you're putting it on your calendar. What are the things, who are my people? And on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, what are the things that I'm doing that is mo moving those relationships along? What can I put on the calendar to do that? Well, my, my company, my consulting firm, we do, we help our clients with pipeline of their donors and we use the system um, Asana, which basically manages their, the flow of the relationships of their donors. And I just wanna end and give a time for question and answer with this one thing that I absolutely adore. We in the nonprofit space, we use this word all the time. It's an etymology lesson now. Passion. I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about my cause. I'm passionate about the work I'm doing. We say it all the time. It's probably the best buzzword that the nonprofit space uses. But the interest, what's interesting is the etymology, the, the, the origins of this word. It comes from Latin, from the word pati, which means passion. And what's interesting means to suffer. But when we know when we use it in conversation, it doesn't, it doesn't mean to suffer. We use it to mean, I, I love it. I love it so much. I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about the whales, right? Whatever it is, I love it. It's not I'm suffering. Why, so why do we use this word? Because the answer is very simple. When you love something, you're willing to suffer for it. Think about our relationships, right? It's not always smooth sailing with our spouses, with our children, with our, with our brothers and sisters. But if we value the relationship, then we're willing to suffer for it. We're willing to put in the work. And when it's the, the things are tough, when the things are difficult, we push through and we make it successful. So when you talk about your work, the thing that shines through more than anything to your donors or your potential donors is they see your passion, that you're willing to suffer for it. You're willing, willing to suffer the setbacks, the challenges, the things that are not always so great. And they can, it comes out of every fiber of your being. A donor is not going to get sold because you can sell ice cubes to Eskimos. They're going to give to you because they see you're passionate and you believe in your cause and you want them to join you in this mission. So I wanted to thank you for having me today. Um, retain that passion, the work that you're doing. It's not necessarily a walk in the park, but the work that you're doing and the time and energy you invest in the relationships will without a question pay off in dividends. I can't tell you what that will look like. It will look like for each one of you separately, even though you're all involved in Gaché, your own experiences are going to look completely different from each other. But allow this to be a lens in front of every conversation you have with the person, every email that goes out, every type of communication that you do is how am I going to retain my existing relationships with authentic relationships? And how do I educate and inspire people to do the mission and to join me as a partner in the mission forward? So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, we have a few minutes. If, if anyone has, um, you know, specific questions for Jonah or something that something that you think, um, you know, he can shed insight on, you know, by all means, we're all, we're all in a meeting format. So just unmute yourself and jump in. Hi, uh, this is Anne Grede. Um, thank you for the uh, uh, nice presentation. It was um, inspiring. Um, I think that at the end, you talked a lot about, you know, um, uh, not companies, not organizations that you want to draw in as sponsors, um, not, um, what's that called in English, foundations, um, where they have a lot of money. It's for um, a country like Denmark, we, we don't have the tradition like from the UK and from the US where you have uh, private people sponsoring things. It's, it's not common. Um, do it a little bit, it's not common. There's a few organizations that can do that, like cancer. Um, uh, and I was gonna say that's about it. Um, <laughs> so, a few others at heart, maybe. Um,
but it, it's um, the way you just described it is not um, is not common. So what I've been listening to recently um, is similar seminars uh, from Denmark, and we have talked a lot about uh, that the organizations need to create our why. Um, and, and that we need to give the wow experience. And I think that's what I kind of took out here as well. I think the why is um, it's become very important to uh, also the very small Gaucher associations, because most of us are very small, that we might need to, you know, it becomes, when you've been in it for a while, the why becomes just something that you have, you know, it's just there. Uh, but you forget how to explain it. Um, like I've recently forgot how to explain to a new nurse what Gaucher was like. That was a bit embarrassing, um, but <laughs> because it's just always been there. So um, can you put a few words on on that part on how to describe the why? Okay, so first of all, let me speak to the idea of being in a, in a country that doesn't emphasize individual giving versus like foundation giving. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually videoing in from, from right outside Jerusalem, Israel. Israel also is very big into grants for foundations and not as much with individual giving. It exists and it probably exists to some degree in Denmark as well, uh, but not, I understand what you're saying. I understand it's not, the, the culture is more focused on, on going to foundations. So what I would say to that is you could either be a piece of paper in an inbox of a foundation or if you do a little bit of research and try to say, how do I develop relationships or an actual put a face to what we're doing to the trustees and the other people who are influential at, at, at those foundations? What I found is you can have a half-baked uh, grant in an inbox and get the full amount of money you want or more if there's a relationship there. The moment they, they see, it, oh, it's them, right? That's a different dynamic than if they've got eight or 10 grant proposals in their inbox and you're just another charity looking for money. So there's without a question an opportunity to develop relationships with people who are, whether it's in media, who have connections, whether it's the foundations themselves. But the more you think in terms of, I can't be the only person doing this, I need to develop a, a cadre of people who can be creative and come up with ways, whether it means give, get us access to foundations, whether it's access in other ways, whether, you know, sometimes you have law firms that, that incentivize their employees to give charitably, like you can see organ companies and organizations do that as well. Why, why should you not be at the table? Like, why should you not have, get that little bit, that piece of market share that you, that you, you deserve? Um, even if you're a smaller organization, you could be a, a priority too. So I would definitely, the only net notion I would challenge is it's not necessarily just has to be focused on, will this person give me money out of their own pocket, but how will they help me advance what we're doing? It might be in-kind donations. I'll give you an example. When I was raising money in Baltimore, Maryland, um, I was in charge of doctors. And I realized that if I would rent a U-Haul truck, it's like a truck you rent by the hour, and I would go to doctor's offices and clean, clean, like spring cleaning of their, all their medication samples that they get from their, you know, from these pharmaceutical companies that send them, it's got like packaging like this, and it's like a pill that's like this big, right? So if I get all this stuff and I take it from them. I'm doing them a favor. I was able to then send it to countries that didn't have access to basic medications like Prevacid, um, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory or reflux or things like that. And it was tremendously appreciated. And then those doctors who became donors without even having to really lift a finger and me showing the duffel bag of the medicine that came from their office going to whatever country it is. It went to Cuba, went to, we had to go to Argentina, went to Cuba, we had a different countries that were getting these medications. They felt like amazing. And then they came to me and said, how else can we help? And we started engaging doctors um, in, in, as a group to participate in bigger ways. So obviously, you know, I don't know necessarily the dynamics going on in your community, but when it comes to engaging people, um, it, it doesn't have to be like a one size fits all. Like, I, like, as I mentioned, it's knowing if you're dealing with foundations, what does that mean? What does that look like? As far as to the why, I think the, the, the real magic on that is really coming up with not the data. I think a lot of times people focus, we serve X number of people, 
you know, why no, you know, number of services that we do. It's really about the story. If you can share a story that gets the heart of what the work that you're doing, everything else becomes details and you can have plenty of time to share that. For example, there is a cancer organization that would, um, that would give uh, day camp experiences for children with cancer, terminal cancer. The doctors would come to the camp. Everybody, they could feel like a normal child. There was a child, and they, this is what the story they told me. There was a boy who was eight years old and he was two weeks away from passing away. He was not doing well. And right a little before he passed away, he called his parents into the room and said, mom and dad, when I die, I wanna be buried at camp. That's what he said. I don't know anything about the organization, right? I don't know the services. I don't, all I know is it made a child say that they want to be buried at camp. Now, that's probably not possible, <clears throat> but what it tells me is that this organization gives such an amazing experience for a child to feel like a normal, healthy child, a typical healthy child, to give them access to a day camp, that they want to be buried at camp. I have plenty of time. I don't have to tell them everything right now. I, I can peel back those layers in the subsequent meetings instead of saying, we do blah, 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 blah. I have plenty of time to share our mission because I found a way to communicate at the core the type of work that they do. So being able to think in terms of the story, in terms of why you're doing what you're doing, um, you don't feel the need to really quickly share all the details. You'll capture it with that one story and people will go, I get it. I understand why you're doing what you're doing and I'm in it for the long haul. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Well, you were just, it was very comprehensive, so we don't know what to ask. <laughs> um, I, I, just so you know, I mean, I'm happy to take more questions. I'm not kicking everyone off here now, um, but like, like I mentioned at the top, um, I, the slides will be available. If anyone has any questions that they don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing in a group setting or a recorded setting for that matter, um, please reach out to me through Aviva, through Biljani, through Tanya. They all have my contact information. I'm happy to be of any help I can be. No charge. Don't feel like, I know everyone's running lean operations. I'm happy to give some basic guidance and some help and maybe point you in the right direction. If you're dealing with a unique challenge on your own, please you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me individually if, if that's a preferred uh, format. Okay, can I ask, um, do you know some mistakes that organizations usually make when try to, to reach their sponsors? Oh man, uh, there's a lot of mistakes organizations make. The question is which one uh, would be helpful and as a learning lesson with this group. Um, I mean, I think my biggest frustration when I was in a bigger organization was there was a, a very kind of an insular attitude. They kind of treat everyone like one size fits all, right? Like, like this is who it's about us as the organization. I'll give you an example. Um, there was a young guy. Now this goes back to early 2000s. Um, this guy's now not a young, not a young guy. He's in, in his forties now, but he was like 22 years old. He was, he owned advertising.com and sold it to AOL for like 30 million or $40 million. A 22 year old kid became a multi, multi, multi millionaire many times over. So he was a local Jewish kid in Baltimore, Maryland, 22 years old, has more money than God. Okay. So we're sitting as a, as a fundraising team discussing who is the right person to develop a connection with this, this young, young guy. So the, the major gifts officer said, maybe it should be me. I should be the one, you know, we're going to be asking you for $10,000. Yeah, maybe it should be me. And then another person said, well, he's, a, he's in tech. So maybe it should be the business and professionals division. You know, all our, you know, the invest, investment bankers and the real estate professionals. So it's our business and professionals audience. And I was brand new. I was I started fundraising when I was 20, I was 20 years old. I was too young to drink in the bars when we do these events. I was 20, 20, 21 years old. And I said, maybe it should be me. Like I play Xbox and PlayStation. This 22-year-old kid is probably play, probably playing Xbox and PlayStation. Like I should be the guy. And I still stand by that to this day. Because in the end of the day, it's not about your organization, it's about the person you're trying to talk to. So you want to think in terms of what's important to them, what are their values, what are their interests, 
and play into that. If they're doing things that are that ha they have their own community, if they if if you're if you live in an area that there's a, a motorcycle club or there's a country club, so you want to be able to connect your mission to them in a, in a language that they can understand in an audience that they can connect to. Because we're it's so easy to be navel gazing to kind of look internally and say this is who we are and how we do things and. You either fit or you don't fit. And the, and the answer really is, is, well, if you think your mission is relevant to the 22-year-old kid just as much as the 62-year-old adult, then let's figure out a way to connect with those people on their level in a way that resonates for them. So that would be one thing I would say is, uh, is usually a, um, a tone deafness to, to the audience that they're trying to talk to. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So thank you, Jonah, so much. Uh, I think we can finish now and uh, this uh, will be uploaded to YouTube and uh, also uh, probably will be translated to Spanish and we'll have subtitles. So thank you very much. See you in uh, another webinar that we will have uh, in November. Bye, so, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You. For Bye. Me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good luck on your work. Stay passionate. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.